Um, welcome, welcome to the People Place. Uh, this is really where we learn from from each other, businesses. I love to highlight businesses from the Chicago land area. Um, I'm Karen Kimsey Swart, and today, joining me today, it's Stephen Ball. Stephen is the senior vice president. Hi, Stephen. You're senior vice president and head of small business banking at Byline Bank. Um, Stephen's had of oh, almost 30 years. Don't want to do, don't want to say over, but almost 30 years experience. Um, banking. Exactly, exactly. Working, working uh, uh, in, in small, small business banking and business banking. So, Stephen, let's start with sharing with us your journey. Well, thank you, and thank you for having me here today. I, I really appreciate it. My journey. It's been 30 years. How long do we have for this uh, program walk? <laughs> no, we'll be really quick. I, I tell everyone I'm a job hopper. Uh, I've written my resume twice since college, coming out of U of I Champaign, and in banking, you don't see that a lot. I started at. LaSalle Bank, straight out of college, spent 14 years there. And if you want more detail, we can talk about it. But moral of the story, I, I was their first small business banker out of LaSalle Northwest National Bank. So that tells you branch banking wasn't even, wasn't even a, a thing back then. You'd have to open up a different bank for every location that you wanted. And 14 years later, we were bought by Bank of America. Since I've always worked in small business in a business banking space, I just didn't feel like my customers were as big to Bank of America as they were to LaSalle. So I looked for another local Chicago-based bank. I really believe that LaSalle was a Chicago-based bank, right? It was American National and First Chicago. And I think LaSalle really filled that gap in Chicago banking. Uh, I went to MB Financial. I went to MB Financial in 2008, March 31st, 2008. Best time in the world to start a new lending group at a uh, at a bank right before the Great Recession. Yes. Oh. Yeah. So somehow survived that. My customers survived. We started bringing over it, but went over there with five of the best bankers that I knew from LaSalle to start business banking at MB. And we could talk about what business banking is compared to commercial banking or retail banking, but you asked for my journey. To make a long story short, once again, 12 years later, MB was bought. Everyone knows it was announced in 2018. We merged with Fifth Third, merged, so they bought us in 2019, and I became group market executive of business banking for the combined organization. Again, I just felt like I could deliver better customer service at a local smaller bank. So once again, I wrote my resume the second time. I don't write, I don't count coming out of college as writing my resume. It's a right. college, almost like the t-shirt from Animal House. It really didn't have anything on the right. I was a caddy. Um, I wrote my resume again, and I knew some people that went to Byline Bank and uh, reached out, and they were very, very gracious. I really believed in the leadership and the mission here, and it's the right size for me to deliver for deliver to small businesses, uh, closely held businesses around Chicago. So just over a year ago, I just celebrated my one-year anniversary. I came over to Byline Bank. I have a team that I know of bankers that I've worked with for one as far as she shook my hand when I came to the bank. She was a personal banker when I was a trainee. And she, you know, she said to sit down and I'll say, be quiet and watch what I do. When she was a branch manager, I was her first business banker. And another person I worked with for 22 years. I mean, when you have a team that you built and you've worked with forever, and I know we'll talk about that later on, it makes the job easy, but it's still, I got my second chance to build a business banking group, just like MB. Byline didn't have business banking. They were looking to fill that gap at the same time that I was looking to find a place to, to start it or to create it or add to it. So it was perfect timing and so far a perfect marriage. Right time, right place, right? So when you mentioned the whole, you know, I think it's important to, so when you think about like small business, what is small business banking uh, for you? Kind of what's your, what if you want to call like your definition or, or the size of businesses or the type of businesses that kind of fall in your, in your purview? Right. No, that's a great question because it changes in what to one bank, what business banking is, another bank, commercial banking is another bank, small business. Really, I've always focused on startups to the first 10 million in revenues. And while 10 million in revenue might sound large to some people that aren't familiar with small businesses, um, it's still mom and pop and the families in there and very, very manageable business. I've worked with businesses that get larger. There's businesses that I've had for 20, 25 years now that are larger and just don't have complex needs. But the one thing with, I think with business banking, there's there's a couple of things that create the secret sauce. One is I always reported to retail banking. I don't want business banking or small business banking to be a training ground for people that wanna be commercial bankers, meaning they wanna go lend 10 million, $50 million, work with $100 million companies. Cause I think that's a disservice to the small business owners. I think this is a career path in and of itself. I've always made it a career path along the way. So 
from port to retail, I work very closely with the branch network. We train them, we work with them. We make sure that they're, I mean, they're the voice in the community. They're there at the community events. They're there at the libraries and the chambers and the outings and what have you. So we arm them and support them along the way. And then the other thing with business banking, the size wise is I never want someone to be looking at a 10,000 or a hundred thousand dollar loan request at the same time they have a $5 million deal on their, on their desk. Who's really going to get, who's really getting to get the service. So I've always held business banking kind of that start up to 10 million. I'd say most of our, most of the clients that hit my business bankers, I do have a team of business bankers there one to 5 million. Most of the customers that are in the branch that we're still working with or helping with the branch, they're the zero to 1 million. And then of course, businesses grow along the way. I think the last census I saw, there's about 4,000 companies in Illinois over 10 million. There's 40,000, one to 10 million and like a half million under a million. And, uh, you know, we can dispute those numbers, but it shows you where businesses are at in Illinois. No, absolutely. So that it no, I think well. people are surprised. Aren't they surprised by, I think, you know, you know, people that don't really follow like small business banking, because many people will think about all the large companies out there. And there are so many, I mean, small, small businesses actually, or small businesses actually are the whole foundation to our economy. Yeah. The percentage of employees that work for small and private businesses is much larger than people think it's yeah. Even the big businesses are, are hiring my customers. You know, my customers are working and in, in supplying Granger or Trader Joe's or, you know, the O'Hare expansion product or project or what have you. So, yeah. It's, One of the things that I'm, I'm very impressed with, and, and you know this, and, and I will say that, you know, uh, to share with our listeners that you and I serve on, um, the board, you're, on, you're an executive on the board, but I'm on the board of Small Business Advocacy Council. And it's really about advocating for, you know, also for, for small businesses. And in getting to know you, um, I, um, I've been very impressed with your, kind of your approach, your approach to customers. You have a very, I think a very strong hmm. philosophy. So share with us about what is that philosophy, your, your, customer, your customer philosophy? It's interesting. You're talking to the guy, everything I read, I'm like, whoa, that sounds amazing. And you look, you're like, wait, I do some of this. I I've, never, I've never put a name to it along the way. And you say customer philosophy. I'm just going to call it a people philosophy. Can I start okay. there? I love Everyone, it. Everyone's important. Yeah. It's never not my job. And you're never someone I can't talk to. Um, I know all the tellers in the bank. I know all the brand, the, the janitors. I, I give high fives to the security guards. So when I'm talking about philosophy with people, I just like people, right? My, my, since I was a 22 year old, fresh on the streets, business banker, and I'd walk into an office and someone would say, how does someone your age know anything about my business? And it's like, Oh, I don't. That's why I'm here to learn about your business. But I do know quite a bit about banking and we can get to know each other. And then the challenge always was this. I don't want to say stuffy, the more proper they were, I'm sorry, I'm not wearing a suit and tie today. The more suited up they were, the more it was my mission to make them smile. I teach now to all the branch managers. Like if you're going out marketing, we're not cold calling. We're not trying to sell product. We're just trying to get to know people. I want their name. I want them to have my name. I want to make them smile. I want to talk about anything but banking along the way. I don't, I don't sell to my customers. Hopefully I'm out there and I'm open and honest and genuine enough and safe enough that they come by for me or they come ask me if they need help. I don't mind saying no, but I'll tell you why. I won't drag anything along. It just, just straight up. I, for too many years, I think bankers could be construed as intimidating. And there's kind of a school of banking that was out there that could be construed as intimidating. And you can see, I don't know if they'll see the video. I, if I line were jeans on Friday, so you can't see that. But yeah. out there, people are people, whether you're a business right. owner or whether you're a banker, whether you're the janitor, whether you're, when I'm walking my dog in the morning, I say good morning to people and they, oh, hey, good morning. They're surprised. So for, for customer philosophy to start, be genuine, right? You can be memorable with your knowledge. I don't push anything. I want to just keep the conversation open. And then another strong philosophy I have is follow up. I, it drives me nuts if I can't get back to someone immediately, at least the same day or next day and say, you know, I'm busy right now. A lot of times I'll be like, I'm in an outing. Can I get back to you tomorrow? I, I even see it within organizations maybe within mine now, but I won't say that. But even within organizations, I'm sure people have emailed someone or emailed a doctor's office or something, or I want an appointment or, you know, my eyes are bad. I'm, you know, the Institute to help me. And you don't get a response in two, three days. That's nuts. So 
uh, follow up, follow through, of course, but follow up, genuine, get to know people, enjoy the people for who they are and make them smile. And maybe that sounds too generic, but is that a customer philosophy? Or? That is a customer philosophy. Okay. Right. So what do we name it? <laughs> we need to come up with a name. Yes. And then you can, you you can trademark it. Right. So, mm -hmm. well, well, when you think about that, so you have that and that's really, really part of your DNA, who you are. So, so what well, you mentioned a little bit about training, but what are some ways where then you, you build that into the, the culture, you build that into, you know, with the people that are working, working for you or with you? Yeah, that's a great question. And, and I see it a stronger challenge with like the branch managers who aren't used to, I mean, the people have been with me 20, 30 years and we could talk about sales non-management that I do. I'm not riding them or what have you, but someone knew it's comfort. It's scary talking to new people. It's scary being at a networking event. It's scary going out in your market and not selling and just getting to know people. And I do it. I'm a different person than you. I'm a different person than the people I train. And that's why I say be genuine. I've seen people kill it with kindness. I've seen people kill it with professionalism. I, I worked with a branch manager who would go around and say, I'm so-and-so and I want to be your banker. That wouldn't work for me. I make people giggle. I always, you know, I try to be quick just to catch them off base and make them think. So I give them a little bit of knowledge. I don't track widgets. I don't overmanage. Like we have minimum number of calls that I want them to make just to, you know, get out like baby bird, go fly. Yeah. That's yeah. okay. But I give them comfort on what success levels are, especially on the first call. I said it earlier, just go out there and find 10 businesses and just get to know the, the gatekeeper. I don't want the business owner. I just want whoever you talk to get to know their name and have them get to know you. And the other thing is with business banking, my business bankers and I, we go out calling with everybody. So I don't just sit there and teach. I go there, go out with them because it's You're scary. Modeling. You're modeling. Yeah, and, and we practice. I, we were talking the other day, I had an in-person training and we you know, we practice with each other. And I always say it's, it's harder to role play with your peers than it is to actually go out and talk to someone. So true, <laughs> yes. Especially like if you were in the room or my learning development team can't come to my training, I'm like, my gosh, are they judging me? What have you along the way? So I think the question is, how do I instill that? I make sure everyone looks inside themselves and figures out who they are. Because if you're comfortable with yourself, if you're comfortable with the knowledge, you have to talk like you trust the business without thinking I need five widgets and go, you'd be surprised because I like to think, maybe I'm naive, I like to think, and what I've seen is people like being happy more than they like being unhappy. Objections are usually just a, a flip reaction because I'm pushing too hard on bad timing. So I don't know, does it sound too idealistic? No, it Go out there and make other people laugh along with hey, me, right? If it does, then I'm right there with you because I, I, I do think that, and, and, and what I, I love is it is the authentic. I mean, because too, too many times people, if they don't show up as their authentic selves, and I've seen this too many times with customer facing individuals where they, they think they have to follow a script or, or do something someone told them to do. And then they mm -hmm. get in front of the customer and it's, they make it about themselves versus making it about the customer. And right. when you were talking about the modeling and the authentic and all that, you're making it about them. And, and we all like for someone to make it about us, right? <laughs> And even the, even the front end, sometimes the front end introductions can seem unauthentic or joking. Yes. You know, you start asking me about a business project you have and I'll turn into Rain Man and I'll go through options and then I'll give, but you know, before you get there, it's not, don't hide behind the position. Don't hide behind the bank. Be you, your, your shield, your strength is who you are. And I would like to think that everyone's in a customer facing position is a likable person. And more importantly, they like people. So use that. I teach my say, how would you say, how would you tell a friend what you do for a living versus a coworker versus someone you meet at a networking event? It should all be the same. Yes. Yes. And, and people get too, too caught up in the whole jargon and, and just, you know, a 30, not 30 minute, but probably a four minute, just right. Ta, 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 you know, and then the, you've lost oh, the person. You've lost the person. Speech. <laughs> yeah. I actually see professional elevator speech and then I'm at the network elevator speech teachers i'm at the networking meeting and i hear the elevator speech and it's wonderful but i know it's what they say every time and i'm like i'm the banker without a tie yeah. i don't know what else <laughs> you know just you go with it I, we talked when when i'm at a networking event and someone asks what i do i say i'm a banker my wife hits me and she's like you're more than a banker i'm like no really i'm just a banker but yeah. she wants me to say i'm Stephen ball i'm senior vice president i run business banking no i'm a banker yeah. even my title everything is just 
what I got from helping businesses do the right things. That's great. So, you know, you, you talked about, so we've talked about, we've talked about foundation philosophy and, and, and when we talk about the people, because our people are such an important part of building teams, right? Cause we, without that, we really can't build, we can't build anything. And so you're mentioning, you have people that you know, that are working with you right now that have like 20 years, they're long time, they're long time colleagues and people you've known along the way. What are, what are some key kind of like characteristics of people that, you know, when you're even asking them, Hey, come along, you know, be on the team. What are some key things that you look for that, that you know that you're going to need um, to help you um, drive for growth and success? That's a great question. I thought a different question was coming. So I was, I was thinking of a different <laughs> answer. But this is almost like if I'm interviewing, it's not necessarily someone I've been with for a while because I've already seen those characteristics. Yeah. When you say when you interview, I can teach credit. I can teach our products. I can teach our system. I can't teach passion and I can't teach personality. Now, one of my one of my top guy, my very top person here that has that came with me from MBO LaSalle and now came here. We were interviewing business bankers from a bank that MB was merging with. And there was one gentleman we had lunch with. We sat there and we had lunch. And afterwards, his boss, the head of retail for Cole Taylor, called me. He's like, I hear it went great. I'm like, it was boring. He's like, but he said it went great. I said, Tim and I are professional at being good lunch dates, but I can't. Right. It's that outgoing power presence. Sometimes I call it. You don't have to be me. I know I'm in your face. I'm probably too loud, but you need you need something. Right. You need something that's engaging. And as I said, I've seen people be engaging because they're super nice, because they're warm, because they're what have you, because they're intelligent. Um, So power presence and passion. I can teach the rest. Obviously, now if I can't teach the rest, we're going to talk because you can't put together a a credit deal or a treasury management or help a customer with fraud. That's a problem, too. (laughs) But yeah, that, that's like the basic stuff. Yeah, I say, if I'm a prospect, would I would I like talking to this person? Mm-hmm. Would I bank with them? Yeah, because so. that's that's at the end of the day. Um, if you're going to put them in front of the customer or or the in front of other people, you want to make sure that they're they're exhibiting that what what you would want them what you would want them to or what you'd like to see. Yeah. A lot of times I hear them say what they heard philosophies were at bigger organizations. And you can hear it when they're talking corporate speak. I'm like, ooh, like that doesn't help the dentist down the street. Yeah. It doesn't help the, right? right? So once again, I'm looking for someone genuine with passion and with a little bit of presence that you remember that you want, you want to talk to. Absolutely. So, you know, also when you, so we take a look at the people, we take a look at, you've been at, you know, several different places, anything as far as, and this is probably what you thought I was going to ask you before, are, are, what are some of the key foundational elements, the foundational elements that really, that, that need to be in place? I mean, obviously, I mean, you know, you t- we talked about the people, but I mean, what are some things that you're like, yeah, these really need to be in place to get it to grow and things that you've seen as you've built teams and built, you know, c- kind of really built this whole, these units all several times now. Right. And we're going to, you, you mentioned teams and people. We should still start there because we all know the people are most important. Right. Chase has a much better technology than Byline, but not everyone banks at Chase. With people, what I'm most proud of at MB Financial, I had no attrition in 12 years unless they moved out of state. And I have to say there are a couple of people that didn't work out, but no one that was productive left the team. And that I lied Two left. They came back like they saw the grass wasn't greener and they came back 12 years. And I had a team as many as 32 people. And what I find it's not just me. You say, what's foundation? First of all, open and honest. A lot of people say they have fun, but people are still worried about what they say. Not, you know, not HR, what they say, but people are still worried about who's out to, we're, we're here to help each other. I would have a monthly team eating, not a team meeting. It's not about putting the team together and building a, a agenda that looks outstanding to the higher ups that spends all day. It's like, no, let's take an hour. Let's show successes. Let's let, you know, different groups come in for maybe another hour. Let's eat in between. And then let's, Go have a go have an adult beverage or not. You don't have to have an adult beverage to be part of the team. But what I found when Fifth Third bought us, it wasn't just me. And you know, my head's not growing too big as I have this conversation with you. Obviously, I like to think I have a big part of it because I set the stage. The team held each other together because everyone was able to be open and honest, because everyone had fun and they saw each other consistently to see each other sitting next to each other in a, in a room while someone was spewing information at them. We actually got together and were together 
They wanted to stay together because they were afraid, not afraid, but there's value in enjoying the people you work with. There's value in knowing that everyone around, whether above or below you in the rankings is there to help you. There's no, you know, I would never hire what I would call a sales shark. I wouldn't sacrifice, um, perf- I wouldn't sacrifice personality for performance. There are a lot of people that I think could have done very, very well numerically, but they would not fit the team, right? I'd rather have a team of B players who got along than a few A's that, you know, were out to get the few C's. It's just for that. Yeah. But we could talk more about the specific with the team and how I managed and how we worked through that. But outside of that, you need the you need delivery of the product. And the way to do that and coming into byline, I made it abundantly clear with all my internal partners here is. I'm going to be that group where it's never, never a fire drill, where the sky is never falling. I can tell a client anything as long as it's the truth. So if it takes you five days, tell me, I will tell them it takes six. If, if I tell you the sky is falling, it's really falling. I also am big. Remember, everyone's important. I'm a huge thank you and please guy. I'm a huge get to know that, you know, the, my loan documentation specialist loves her dogs. My you know, my treasury management rep, he came from PNC and, you know, da, 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 da. It's like, once again, delivery of the product, but you do it through understanding the capabilities of your organization, not over-promising, under-delivering. We all hear that in sales, but yeah. I'm not afraid of losing a sale by telling the truth of what I can deliver. I'm afraid of losing a sale by telling something I can't deliver on. And the way to get delivery yeah. is to know your product, thank you and please, yeah. treat everyone with respect internally. And... Don't, you know, don't push them around. Right. When I need a favor, it's probably been a year. And you know what? I get that favor. <laughs> well, you know, it's interesting because somebody would be, you know, somebody listening to this would be thinking, okay, come on, this sounds too good to be true. Yet, yet we all know. I mean, research shows you're seeing with your successes, a lot of these, I mean, I call them fundamental elements um, are so key to building a culture and we know it and it's the doing. So what I see, you, 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 it's, you know and do. But many, many people, many, many business owners I know, they're like, well, I know to do that. You know, I can see it, but it takes, a, it, it takes effort and focus to actually do it every day. It's scary to tell a customer something they don't want to hear, even though you're solving something they want solved. Yes. I would rather someone be 100% correct. And once in a while, I have to wait. We ordered new windows for the house. I don't know why. They're expensive. It seemed like no wind was getting in. No birds were flying into the house. Don't know why I needed No rain was coming in. Dollars. Yeah, it's like, but we're losing air. I mean, you go ahead and tell me the price of air conditioning versus the price of new windows. And basically, I can keep them open all, yeah. all uh, summer long and never make up my money back. But And they said, they're like, hey, delivery won't be until end of September. And about a month ago, I got a letter and they said, sorry, supply chain. It's probably October. That's okay. They didn't have to say, you know what, I'll get it in June. And then June comes and they're like, ah, how about July? How about August? How about, um, but it's tough to tell a customer what they don't, what you don't think they want to hear. Yeah. And I think what they want to hear is just give me a realistic expectation so they can plan yeah. along the way. Exactly. Now, there are internal people that don't deliver to the levels that I think they should deliver. You make sure you document it. You make sure you watch it. You talk to them first. And then I'm obviously at a level where I can talk to their managers if need be. I'm not just captain nice i'm captain fair but i'm not out to get anyone and i think yeah. if, if i ever had to call people out they know why and they knew it was coming and they know exactly and but you got to do it so i'm not trying to say it's all perfect right we're just talking front end philosophy no, exactly exactly so so okay here here's a question for you so it's not all, all rainbows and butterflies and yeah, um, no yeah, yeah. <laughs> so what has been if you if you go back and think because I have so I probably have a lot more of these than you do, but just a time when, like a, a leadership lesson, where when when maybe something happened, that where you know you're like you know I really learned a lesson from that, that may, might yeah. not have gone as well, that you can that you can share with us. <laughs> yeah, well, I had to had to be written up for that one, so I can't talk. No, Here's, <laughs> actually, I learned my sales shark through someone else. I had, I had employees that were great in sales and people were willing to do, and one ended up underneath me and people were willing to do anything because of the production. And we were sacrificing some standards for production. And I hired in someone that I knew from the past. I put them underneath this gentleman just because I had no choice. This was a division manager. 
the person I was hiring him was below. And I just saw it destroy the atmosphere of the group. And I saw a division manager, I'm calling them sharks. And maybe they're great people. They're just, you know, maybe I'm just a guppy. So I don't like sharks. Who knows? Um, I saw them have their their banker, right? I saw the, the manager have their favorite and the other two people suffer. And I don't think I stepped in hard enough. I don't think I coached well enough. And at the time, I also had a manager who was almost protecting the person below me. So I got caught in the middle and I tried to ride the ride probably longer than I should have. And I think whenever you see, uh, lack of a better term, a, a cancerous personality on your team, in your team, you, you have to act fast because while people you know, appreciate how you treat them. If anyone gets a different, gets treated differently, there better be a real reason why I go back to when I was a business banker, a line lender, I'm in my twenties and my manager would email out, Hey, maybe if you guys worked as long as the administrative assistants, we'd be making our numbers. Well, who ran into the boss's office? I did. And you know what? I was 300% a goal. So there's another lesson I learned. Don't email everybody over. Don't hide the problem. It's okay to talk directly to people. You don't have to manage your high producers the same as your low producers, the same as your middle. You don't need blanket emails. In fact, it's better, I think, stepping in. So it's stepping in sooner. It's how you step in. It's don't hide behind a blanket email to the team, hoping the people that need to get the message will get the message. Well, you yes. know who will hear the message? The, the best people will. Yes. They don't need the message. <laughs> They're it's the only like, ones that care. That's why they, you, they it is, have an email. It's so the truth because the high performers are in you know, the office going, okay, what did I do wrong? And what do I need to do? No, stop. Right. This wasn't meant for you. And, and you're right. It gets It totally gets lost in the one person's life. Well, I'm sure that doesn't. That doesn't apply to me when when it really right. is. So I love the, I love the direct and the direct feedback, and, and I've also had that experience where you know and, and as as if you would call it as sales managers, right? If, because we're in customer facing, it is about growth. So we've got to look at that. I mean, and I have had situations where you have someone who's such a top performer, yet they're they're killing the culture, they're killing the way right the way they get the business, and it it's hard. I mean, it's easy to go, oh, yeah, yeah, you know, um, let's take a look yeah, at this. Oh, it's but, Steven or it's Karen. No, right. But I mean, it's 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 hard then when your biggest producer, because if the biggest producer is causing the the issues in the culture, it's kind of hard to let it go and let them go. But I, I also learned early on, if you let it go, it totally destroys anyone else, you know, and that's where then you get the high turnover yeah, and I can't have turnover on my, even though I don't run the internal groups, I can't have turnover there. I need them to see, I want them to see my group as the nice group. My group is, a, I had harder situations. I've had two bankers that were good people, nice people, and they didn't realize they were running over the back room. And there are people that, you know, almost like a puppy dog in the corner when you say bad dog, when you went, and they were like, you know, it's easy when the person's just a jerk overall, right? They're like, hey, you know, they're jerk. But when people are really nice people and they have, I had someone that got, you know, his temper started to flare a little too much. It's like, I've had the look before you leap. Don't type that email. It's instantly gratifying, but it does no good. <laughs> I think, uh, I don't know. I've had people call me soft because you don't just attack, right? You listen, you put it out there, but secretly you're, you're coaching along the way, right? My team jokes, they say, I can tell you that you're doing a terrible job with a smile and then they feel guilty about it and they go do it. But there's no confrontation there. There right. doesn't have to be. It's being, being, you know, well, I mean, making it more people centric as well, because I mean, you're yeah. right. People don't walk in every day or I'd say most people, most people don't walk in every day and say, hey, I'm going to mess it up and I'm going to I'm going to tick off this piece people. And right. I mean, they don't they don't. And, and many times we don't we don't know. We have those blind spots. And we right. don't know. And then if they don't have anyone telling them what's going on, that, that's where I think it just it just kind of it just simmers and it's really a bad culture. So do you have anything in place where where you, you know, I mean, I, use, I know you say you bring it up, but but how do you get the trust? How do you gain the trust of even the um, the people like in the branches, the retail site to even say this to you? Right. You're there with them. You help them. Like 
think of the team at TZI one-on-ones, you know, we have the team meeting, we have a weekly just check-in call, but with the branches, once again, it goes to response. It also goes to, I might not know the branch manager of our Cicero location as well as I know the branch manager here at Broadway, Maine, Mm -hmm. but I know when we had the company event, I went and sat by her. I know if I see she does a good job, I send an email directly to her. You know, it's once again, it's identifying, it's separating out the people saying, you're not just one of 36 managers, you are this person or that person. I don't want to name names because then we'd have to get the yeah. rights. They want royalties. <laughs> you know, you are this person. I think, but I also think overall persona, like, you know, you, I knew right away that you were an open, honest, genuine person when I met you. I think people are intuitive. They can yeah. tell if yeah. you truly care, if you're truly someone there, but then it takes a little bit of effort on top of it. And I can't do it just from this office that I'm sitting in. I have to do it directly with all the people as I slowly, because then also you're spreading the word. Right. So I was like, no, no, I talked to Stephen. I needed help with a customer. He came out and spoke to him with me. And because his banker was out on vacation, really, Stephen? Yeah. yeah. Can I do that? Yeah. yeah. My, I want to say my fourth day at Byline, one of the regional managers calling, they're saying, we're having a blitz day. Would you like to join us? I said, absolutely. I went cold calling with 10 people I didn't know. Like, go ahead. I'll knock on doors with you. Fine. I Those 10 it. people instantly like yeah. he's it's your, it's your credibility it's your credibility so i also think i took too many of the sandwiches they had afterwards but <laughs> I, I, I thought they had more i apologize so now i know i eat too much and i'm always that's willing to help that's why they they invite you but tell you you know after they've eaten oh oh by the way that's right the food's here the food's here <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> exactly so you that's know smart. last topic um and, and this is one where um it's customers your customers any key themes that you're hearing from customers? And just we talk about these different these different times with the whole, you know, kind of reset, recession. Just kind of was thinking about this as we were talking. I mean, what are you yeah. hearing from your from from just just from your customers, key themes with them and any just kind of words, words you words of advice you have for for all of us small businesses? Oh, boy, that's true. You know what? I just had that question asked. I was on the Goldman Sachs 10,000 small businesses panel this morning in person. So now I have a bunch of small business customers I'm following up with. I love it. This is third recession. Well, it's not a recession yet. No. But this is kind of the third, four, let's call it the fourth time I've, troubled time I've been through banking. 2001, right, dot com. Boom. We saw it happen. 2008. I was there. <laughs> yeah. 2008 started with banking. Here's the worst recession ever. COVID. Obviously, I was on the phone. I you know, I think my team did $700 million in PPP loans down to independent contractors needing $400. We're there. And now everyone's thinking recession. But the lessons, the lessons that we learned is how do you prepare for a rainy day? And when I was asked this morning, what's the biggest piece of advice you had for small businesses? It was, and it wasn't recessionary based, but what you see is it helps you during these times. Growth for the sake of growth is not worth it. Don't beat your chest trying to get to 2 million or 5 million or 10 million. Don't open the fifth store if you don't have the second store up and running. I've seen companies that do 800 grand in sales, make 300,000 profit, turn into $10 million companies making 50,000 in profit. But now they can say they're a $10 million company. Growth for the sake of sales, growth, not a good thing uh, along the way. And, you know, just watch how far you're extended, right? I, I, I see the, I had a customer once that, and once again, this goes for both sake of growth. They were a packaging house and doing very, very well. They signed a contract with Anheuser-Busch. They got another sp- space. They rented it out. They got all this new equipment. It would have doubled their sales. Hockey stick growth. Yes. Anheuser-Busch yeah. decided no. They went out of business. Oh. So whether it's a recession, whether it's a giant customer, giant leap, what have you, know where you're at. You're already you're already the bravest people on the planet. If you start a business, right? I'm the coward. I work for corporate America. You have the, you, you're good at what you do. You have the belief you're going to succeed. Now you have to figure out how to temper that to the steps you can take. So you're always ready in case something's around the corner. The banker in me says, get a line of credit now before business is bad. Who cares if you need it or not? Just put it in your back pocket because there is no business credit, but there is relationship you can build with the bank. But the true small business advisor in me says, Watch your margins, your best customers, they don't pay you. They're not your best customers and don't grow just for the sake of a number you're trying to catch. Right. Great, great lessons. And kind of, kind of right now, just thinking about recession proof, right? That's what we're doing. We're kind of recession proofing 
our businesses and kind of thinking about and thinking about and thinking about that as we go as we move forward. That's great advice, I think, anytime, but especially right now. Right. I mean, I'm starting a business here at Byline. I have four people. They're like, you want to double your people? I'm not yet. Like, let's make sure it's going to take me two, three years to become profitable here. Mm -hmm. So why would I make it so that it takes six years when there's a potential slowing of the economy coming? No, absolutely. So great. Well, thank you. This has been this has been wonderful. So many That's insights. Uh, love your love your so. enthusiasm. No, love your enthusiasm for the for the customer, for what you do, the passion passion for small businesses. Um, I'm, I'm just impressed with what you do for small businesses every day, not only in your job, but also in your, you know, in your, in your service work and, and just, and just what you do, just really great, greatly, uh, greatly appreciate that. And I know I have a lot of respect for you in that way. So thank you. Oh, thank you. Yeah. So thanks for so having thank me. Very much. I appreciate it. Yeah. Thanks.